Paris at night. The Eiffel Tower dominates the night sky with an amazing 20,000 lights. Notre Dame, home of the Hunchback. The astonishing Millennium Carousel downtown. The Champs Elysees, and at its head, the magnificent Arc de Triomphe. But there's a much more secret side to Paris. Few will ever admit going there, but this is the city's busiest nighttime district. The Pigalle is the heart of the sex industry. Its streets teeming with CD clubs, brothels, and strip shows. But its most famous club is tucked away between the neon lights, the legendary red windmill of the Moulin Rouge. This is where the sexiest dance of all, the Can-Can, was invented here back in 1889. When it was first performed, the sight of women kicking up their skirts to reveal all shocked the world. Legend has it that four years later, this was also the birthplace of striptease. Today, the frilly skirts have gone, replaced by space-age silver suits. But some things never change. The outfits come off just the same. Twice a night, the audience get an eyeful of naked flesh. But the real surprise is that this landmark of French entertainment isn't very French anymore. All but 10 of the showgirls come from outside France. One of the show's two principal dancers is a 24-year-old American, Michelle Archoey. She worked in Las Vegas before moving to Paris six months ago. I think being at the Moulin Rouge, it being part, part of history, people look at it as, wow, you're a dancer, and they put you there up on a pedestal. Michelle performs in front of 1,200 people every night, but going topless doesn't bother her. When we're dancing on stage, um, it, it's not like we're, we're topless. Um, you know, the, some of the girls are covered, some are topless, but after a while, you don't even notice it. You're, you're looking at the, the decor is amazing, uh, the theme of each number, um, the costuming, the headdresses, the bijou, it, um, and also the, the beauty of a woman's body, the femininity. It's just beautiful. For Michelle, Keeping in shape is essential to her work. If any dancer loses or gains too much weight, the Moulin Rouge can fire them. They measure your bust, your waist, your hips, your thigh, and your knee when you first come in and they weigh you and they take pictures. If someone abnormally gets larger or smaller, then they have something to back them up if they would like to get rid of somebody. Backstage, there's none of the glitz and glamour that the audience sees. Michelle shares her cramped dressing room with another dancer from Russia. The girls get through an amazing 20 costume changes every night. Heavy stage makeup is the secret to being noticed in the spotlight. Sometimes, even friends and relatives don't recognize the dancers with their full grace paint on. Getting better, progressing. I've heard many stories of people who work with each other uh, saying hello to someone and then not realizing that they just spoke to them five minutes ago with the person having full makeup on and didn't realize it was them. <laughs> the stage show appeals to everyone. Kings and queens have dropped in to see it, and Liza Minnelli and Janet Jackson have both played here. As its latest star, Michelle is hoping that Paris will make her famous too. She's one of the city's surprising secrets, an all-American girl center stage at the Moulin Rouge. <laughs> Paris is the city for lovers. Thousands come here to chance their hand at seduction to meet the partner of their dreams. They're following in a great tradition. It was here that American divorcee Wallace Simpson played out the romance that made a British king quit the throne. And where Napoleon, the man who conquered most of Europe, first seduced Josephine. The French call it l'amour, but beneath the surface of the city of romance, there's an astonishing secret. The reason the French are so renowned as lovers is they learn it at a school of seduction. This is Veronique Julien, an expert in the ways of love. She started a school of seduction in the heart of Paris five years ago. Men and women 
can now come here and learn the secrets of attracting the opposite sex. The kind of people who come to see me are usually single or divorced. But I also get people who are married and who would like to learn how to seduce their partner afresh. Then there are people who come to see me for their work, wanting to learn how to become more charismatic, more seductive. The latest to sign up for tuition is Laurent Boyi, a 36-year-old telephone engineer. He's lost his confidence with women after splitting with his girlfriend. He's been attending the school for five months. Laurent is a bachelor, one of many in Paris, who basically has everything going for him. He's good-looking, tall, charming, but he lacks the most important thing, because to seduce a woman these days, you have to have self-confidence. To succeed in the world of Paris nightlife, Laurent needs to learn all the tricks. First, a lesson in the secrets of body language. He has to pretend he's a movie star. Okay, now it's an exercise very important. Mm -hmm. It's the body language. Yes. You're James Bond. Mm. You know why? No, but I'm going to know. <laughs> because James Bond is confident, mm -hmm. sexy, yes. secure. Mm -hmm and the woman will love him. Okay. Okay? Yes. Now you follow me. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Laurent has to copy Veronique's confident walk. Everything about him is analyzed. The way he moves, stands, and sits. I'm a very handsome man. I would like to make love with all the women I want. You look at a very beautiful woman, okay? How do you feel? I feel okay. The idea of role-playing James Bond is to get in the mood for sex and seduction. He has to pose with an imaginary gun, just like the screen hero, to imagine himself as a great lover. The myth of the French lover has disappeared, otherwise my seduction school wouldn't be doing so well. Learning the secrets of seduction doesn't come cheap. It can cost you as much as $5,000 for a course like this. It also includes a makeover of your image. But for Laurent, it's worth every cent. Now transformed with a smarter outfit to match his newfound confidence, it's time to put what he's learned into practice with a willing victim. Veronique takes Laurent to try his new seduction skills in the unlikely setting of a women's dress shop. The sales assistant is a friend of hers. Laurent is visibly nervous at first. So what you're seeing here is an exercise in role-playing, which I do with all my clients. Laurent chats up the sales assistant. He pretends he's there to buy a dress for his sister. The aim of the exercise is to impress the young woman with his seductive charm. If he's confident with her, a new love affair may be around the corner. I think that love knows no limits. And if you really want to experience love, then I believe that everyone can and has the right to it. Laurent passes the test with flying colors, and the once shy telephone engineer is ready to take on the women of Paris once more. Coming up, Paris's latest and greatest nighttime activity. It's a secret shared by up to 28,000 people every week. The most exclusive hotels in Paris, France, attract the world's biggest names. Jack Nicholson and Meg Ryan have stayed here at the $700 a night George V Hotel. The Crillon Hotel, next to the American Embassy, is where Madonna seeks privacy when she's in town. But anyone turning up at this hotel would be in for a shock. From the outside, the Hotel du Nord looks like any other hotel. It advertises three-star accommodation, and the manager seems ready to welcome everybody. But it's just a front. This isn't a hotel at all. Behind the facade is a secret comedy club. Remarkably, comedians from the US regularly play here. The audience is largely expatriate. There are an astonishing 75,000 Americans living in Paris. Tonight, it's rising star of the stand-up circuit, Dave Fulton, who's in the limelight. His routine includes the frustrations of trying to buy a croissant from a Parisian. And one morning I was really hungry, and I went to this bakery to get something to eat, or as they call it, a patisserie. 
which to me kind of sounds like I gotta, I gotta dance with a guy when I get in the door. <laughs> but I'm ready, I have a little phrase in my book. I was like, ah, bonjour, monsieur, a croissant, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> this guy looks at me and he goes, croissant? <laughs> Ah, you know the place. <laughs> the comedy club at the Hotel du Nord is the idea of Paris king of comedy, Carol Beer. In the 1960s, it was a famous hotel, but over the years, it became run down. Rather than demolish it, the facade was kept, but the rooms inside converted into a bar and club. Well, we have to learn a foreign language. I work there and I drink there. <laughs> a lot of the performers, uh, when they're coming to do shows here, the first question they ask is whether they can stay in the venue. And a lot of people coming uh, specifically to Paris uh, who've heard about uh, the, the stand-up comedy shows and say, oh, best of both worlds, we can see a stand-up comedy show and stay in the venue or in the hotel overnight. Of course, the Hotel du Nord hasn't been a hotel for about 30 years. It's one of Paris's best-kept secrets. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, croissant. He goes, croissant? <laughs> oh, yeah, croissant. He goes, croissant. And, and I swear to God, folks, there is a tray of 150 croissants right in front of him. He's going around the room. Croissant? Qu'est-ce que c'est croissant? And it's that French thing where they're insulting you but being very polite about it. That probably keeps you from killing them. And I'm trying to be nice, and finally I just snapped and became the ugly American tourist. I know I must be dwelling in all of this. And I finally went, hey, a roll, you froggy You know, when you tell people back in America, you know, I do shows in Paris, they immediately go, do you speak French? You know, no, it's all expats. And, and um, you know, it's like, cool. I could relate to a lot of what he said because I lived in Paris for a while, and the routine about the croissant and stuff just killed me. And um... Loved it. I just loved it. Yeah, I thought it was great. I thought it was really fabulous, and I enjoyed the a little bit of American humor fun here in Paris. <laughs> For Fulton, there's another secret attraction to playing Paris. He gets a vacation with his girlfriend in this most romantic of cities. I met somebody that I like spending time with who doesn't necessarily need to be amused by me all the time. The cool thing about coming to Paris is if you can share it with somebody else and go around and see some of the sights around uh, Paris you know, spit off the top of the Eiffel Tower. These are things Americans do. Be really rude. I gotta get that one done. Yeah, walk around and scream louder in English. I want a beer. Fulton won over the audience. The Hotel du Nord and its secret world of laughter is set to continue with audiences eager for American humor in the heart of Paris. Friday, the busiest night of the week in Paris. Anyone following the guidebook would probably head for the Bastille, the buzzing heart of the city's entertainment scene. But the biggest crowds aren't here, they're downtown. The offices may be closed, but thousands of young Parisians are in on the most amazing secret of the night. They're gathering for the biggest weekly party in Europe. Everybody who has discovered the secret location is invited. The meeting place was disclosed on an internet website only this afternoon. Exactly where they'll go is still a mystery. What's certain is that tonight, these rollerbladers will bring Paris to a standstill and force the police to close the city streets. As yet, nobody knows how many will turn up. The highest attendance, which was last year, was 28,000. As soon as the weather's warm again, you get between 10 and 15,000. This evening, I think we're going to exceed the 10,000 mark, and maybe even hit 12 or 13, because the weather's been good all day. These amazing Friday night races began with a handful of people seven years ago. They soon became so popular that the rollerbladers drove the Parisian traffic off the roads. The route is 15 miles long and takes four hours. They won't finish until two in the morning. Many do it just for fun, but for some, there's another secret purpose, to campaign for the environment. It's more about being able to reclaim the streets from the cars. Driving around town, people don't get much out of their city, whereas people on rollerblades really get to see it. They hear their city, they feel it. They realize that Paris isn't flat. It's a pleasant city, but to appreciate it, you have to be on rollerblades or on foot. 
Others have yet another secret reason for joining such a big party. It's a way to meet the opposite sex. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way to, to, uh, to, meet, some, to meet some friends and uh, to meet some uh, also girls for, for boy and boy for girls. <laughs> because it's a new uh, uh, freedom, it's a new mentality, it's a new um, way of life also then, that's why. This new way of life can have its ups and downs, so a fleet of ambulances trails the rollerbladers. Every week, about five of them will end up in hospital with broken limbs. Despite all the organization, rollerbladers still create havoc, and parts of Paris come to a standstill. For those who can't stand the pace, there's always a cafe to sit it out. It lasts something like three or four hours, and so it's too much when you are not used to. You know? So two hours for us is far enough. Maybe they'll be back next Friday, when the rollerbladers will take over Paris once again. After the break, more secrets of Paris nightlife. A secret concert hall where the best music in Paris can be found. Another night is falling, and the streets of Paris are heating up. Crowds flock to the city's theaters, cinemas, and clubs, or for a musical boat ride on the River Seine. A night at the Bastille Opera House to see a top show costs around $100 a ticket. But there's a secret and much cheaper way to hear great music. Parisians in the know head for a secret concert hall underground, where the tickets cost just $1.50 each. Amazingly, some of the best musicians in town can be found in the subway, or the metro as it's called here. Unlike any other city in the world, they can't just turn up and play. They have to pass an audition before they're allowed to perform. Twice a year, hundreds of classical, jazz, and rock musicians turn up at this unremarkable building. They're hoping to win one of the 300 street performers' licenses which will be granted. Competition is tough, and tensions high as they tune up. One by one, they're summoned to the basement where a jury await. This incredible scheme was set up by Metro official Antoine Nasso. His mission? To entertain commuters while waiting for their trains. We set up this scheme specifically for people using public transport because we saw a need for quality music. We also wanted to liven up the subway. But there was also another reason. Before the auditions, subway staff were flooded with complaints about the terrible rackets passengers had to endure. Let's face it, there are a lot of talented people out there, just as there's a lot of useless ones who have no musical aptitude. That's why we hold auditions, to weed out the good ones from the bad. Standards are now high. These musicians are students at the world-famous music school, the Paris Conservatoire. The judges are all employees on the subway. Their tastes are wide-ranging, but their decisions can make or break young careers. I hope to win some international competitions. Well, one can always dream. Failing that, I would like to join a decent orchestra so that I can earn a living, have a wife and children. <laughs> As qualified street performers, they can earn up to $90 a day each. And for some, playing on the metro might even lead to a more prestigious career. A number of soloists, composers and musicians did indeed start out in the subway. They were spotted by talent scouts from record companies and are now pursuing their careers. I hope they become famous one day. This group was successful and won their license. Now commuters have wonderful music to listen to on their way to work. And maybe a lucrative record deal is just around the corner. <laughs> Buried under the streets and sidewalks of Paris lies a grisly secret. An astonishing six million skeletons are piled up in vast hidden catacombs closed from public view. 
they were transferred here from massively overcrowded cemeteries before the French Revolution. But subterranean Paris has an even more astonishing secret. There are 1,300 miles of tunnels and sewers under the city. They're on standby as a nuclear fallout shelter. And during the Second World War, French resistance fighters hid from the Nazis down here. Parisians take their sewers so seriously that they even have a museum dedicated to them. It's late at night, and most of Paris is sleeping. But in this seemingly quiet office, tucked away by a canal, a group of very special men wait for a call. Before the night is out, they'll have been on a rescue mission that will lead them underground to a dark and hidden side of Paris that they alone ever see. For this is the emergency sewer squad, and even the police stay away from the area they're about to enter. As they race through the city, they could be about to encounter anything from a flood, a dead body, or even retrieving hidden treasure. Their work is dangerous and unpredictable. Two teams are on call 24 hours a day. Tonight's call out is routine. A young American has dropped his keys down a drain and is stranded. You've lost your keys? Fuhr Lloyd is one of the many unfortunate people in Paris who've had vital belongings swallowed up by the sewers. His keys have fallen down a sidewalk gutter, one of 18,000 which drops straight down to the sewers. We were taking the groceries out. We live here in the area. So after, uh, we just dropped it simply. We dropped and it bounced and it was in there. A real bad situation because it's not just the car keys, it's everything. In an average night, the squad gets three or four calls like this one. We recover around 60 to 70 items each month. At least one is lost every day. We get everything from house keys, car keys, remote controls, jewelry and cell phones. These are, these are all regularly recovered. It might look like a simple recovery operation, but the team know the sewers are a dark and dangerous world. With nearly 1,500 miles of tunnels, even heavy objects can be washed away forever. The sewer squad can walk up to three or four miles in their search. Sometimes priceless jewels end up in the sewers, but not always by accident. The squad were once called out to recover jewelry which had been hurled down there after a lover's tiff. When we got there, I found 11 pieces of jewelry, rings, chains, necklaces. There was a tiny ring I didn't find. It was a, a young lover's tiff. The lady was so grateful to us. It all sorted itself out in the end, but it was one of the more unusual things that happened. The sewers even have street signs, just like those above ground. The Rue de Rivoli is one of the city's main shopping streets. This part of the hidden city dates back over 200 years. Above ground, they anxiously wait for news. Worst case scenario, we get some new keys, you know, and buy them. Other than that, you know, hopefully, you know, the guy can find the key. It should be, uh, the keys are heavy, so it should be exactly right here. Unfortunately, this time, the keys couldn't be found. They were probably swept away in a torrent of waste water. Despite all the efforts, it's a disappointing night. Lloyd and his friends will have to call a locksmith. But in a good month, the sewer squad has a success rate of around 75%. Their bizarre work reveals a hidden Paris that nobody ever sees, and few would want to. Among the secrets of Paris nightlife still to come, the erotic tango in Paris is back in town. The French make and drink more wine than any other country in the world. 
Each year, they bottle one billion gallons of the stuff. And on average, each French citizen drinks almost one and a half bottles a day, every day of the year. In France, wine is big business. The French countryside is covered with thousands of vineyards. This is just one of them. But it's no ordinary vineyard. It has an amazing secret, because it's right in the center of Paris. Nearby is the white dome of Sacré-Cœur Cathedral and the narrow, cobbled streets of the artist's neighborhood, Montmartre. 500 years ago, this area was covered with vineyards. Amazingly, wines made here were considered among the best in France. Over the years, the countryside disappeared and the vineyards were built over, but somehow this one survived. Francis Gourdin has been running it for five years. Peu de gens Few people know exactly where it is, apart from the real wine lovers of Paris, the connoisseurs of old Paris, because the district is on the northern slope of the hill, off the usual tourist trail. Gourdin checks his vines regularly, looking for signs of a good harvest. The secret of a good harvest lies in the number of early leaves on the vines. One, two, three, four leaves. This four-leaf stage is the most important part of the vine's development. It tells you how well the growing is progressing. If all is well, in three months, grapes will start to appear. Then they'll be ready for harvesting in the autumn. The city hall, ten minutes away, reveals another secret of the Paris vineyard. Beneath this building lies an astonishing world. While bureaucrats shuffle papers upstairs, deep below, hidden in the cellars, Gordin turns his grapes into wine. It's something not even the locals know. The cellar where the Montmartre wine is made is not known at all. Very few people know that the wine is made in the cellars of the town hall in the middle of the city. With his barrels and magic, Gordin turns the grapes into wine. They're fermented for up to two months before being bottled and left for another 12 months. Remarkably, from this little room, a thousand bottles of wine are produced every harvest. Gordin is very proud of his Paris wine. He believes it's very drinkable, with a unique character. It has quite an acidic bite, so it's a vinegary wine, as are all Parisian wines, a bit like the Parisian character. A bit acidic, a touch aggressive. Most people never discover the pleasure of Paris wine, one of the city's hidden and most delightful secrets. It's not just wine the French are famous for, but food too. And in Paris, there are over 8,000 restaurants to choose from. The most expensive of all is the Gourmet Tour d'Argent. Its name even translates as Tower of Money. Celebrities and millionaires dining here can choose from the longest wine list in town. The cellar holds an incredible half a million bottles. Surprisingly, one of the Tour d'Argent's wine suppliers is not French, but English. Tim Johnson has been in the wine trade for 30 years, and nobody knows more secrets about drinking well in Paris. One of the things about drinking wine in Paris is that people have this strange notion that you can go into a cafe and sit down and order a glass of uh, red wine, carafe wine, um, and that it'll be absolutely fantastic. And in fact, you know, in many cases, they serve you rubbish that uh, most supermarket chains um, in Britain or in the States would and wouldn't buy. Did you want anything else to taste? No, I don't think so. With all his experience, he knows exactly the right questions to ask. The best question that somebody could ask a barman is, do you like this wine? If you've gone in the right place, choose somebody with nice rosy cheeks, um, who obviously does drink wine, um, then you're more likely to get a straight answer, a real answer. But if you're drinking wine in Paris, 
Johnson has a surefire tip to ensure you get the best. And it's also one of the cheapest. For me, the hottest tip these days for drinking a really good glass of straight red wine would be Caudurin. It's one of these wines that even if you go into an awful cafe, there's a very good chance that if you order a glass of Caudurin, that you'll get something perfectly drinkable. Um, and it should never be expensive. With Johnson's knowledge, the secrets of drinking well in Paris can be enjoyed by anyone. Paris has provided the backdrop for some of the world's most enduring stories. The Hunchback of Notre Dame and the Phantom of the Opera. Ernest Hemingway and Scott Fitzgerald both came here when they were young, looking for inspiration. Their legacy lives on at Shakespeare and Company, the oldest bookstore in Paris. It sells both old and new books, mainly in English. But this is no ordinary bookstore. Its dusty interior hides a much more extraordinary secret. At night, after the store is closed, you can sleep under the bookshelves without paying a cent. American owner George Whitman offers guests a free place to stay in this makeshift hotel. We call it the Tumbleweed Hotel. I usually invite people for a week and see how they act, and maybe I prolong it then. But one man has been staying here for five years. Shakespeare and Company is in the most expensive part of Paris, where the average hotel room costs $200 per night. The young Hemingway and Fitzgerald would have found this kind of money impossible to pay, as does this American writer of today. Kurt Bunch from Florida came to Paris five months ago to fulfill his dream of writing a novel. To begin with, he had a girlfriend in tow. When I first arrived at Shakespeare and Company, she was with me, and George immediately said, Marry her today and you have an apartment upstairs for a week. We didn't get married and we didn't stay upstairs, but that's how I met George and he invited me to stay anyway. He had a very gruff voice. It was kind of scary almost. Whitman has helped hundreds of aspiring writers in his time. He was friends with Hemingway and Jackie Kennedy visited the store, leaving a signed picture as a memento, but she didn't stay the night. There are nine beds scattered among the shelves. During his stay, Bunch has slept in most of them and learn the secret of which is best. The Russian section is the most comfortable bed to sleep in. They each have their own personality of sorts, according to their section. Like the art section is sort of cramped and yet can provide really good dreams. But the Russian section is big and is good for doubling up voluntarily, of course. And uh, also a good place to discover people because it's right near the sink where everybody washes their teeth. But the romantic section upstairs is by far the most comfortable and the best to stay in and the most coveted spot of all the Shakespeare and Company beds. But there's a catch. Guests have to be out of the store during opening hours, make their own beds, help with chores, and more besides. If you stay here, you have to earn your keep by, um, one is you have to write a biography, which George keeps in a huge file, um, and another is that you have to do hours of work a day and that hours of work can entail anything from straightening up books in the store, to washing the floors, to vacuuming, to cleaning books. Usually it's not too bad for work. And the more that you help him, the more willing he is to let you stay longer and the more willing he is to, to help you out. But for Bunch, it's a price worth paying as he wants to stay until he's finished his novel. People who want to stay here don't have to book, they just have to write one. A bookstore with a fantastic secret hidden between the shelves. Are you gonna come Sunday night to the Coming up next, the best places to kiss in Paris, French style. France gave to the world the patisserie. It also gave croissant, baguette, gâteau, éclairs, meringues, and more tarts than you can put names to. They're everywhere you look in Paris. But the city's best bakery is in a quiet back street where no one would expect. The Poilain Bakery is the store that Steven Spielberg and a host of American stars all have their bread delivered from. Even Frank Sinatra had it flown across the Atlantic from here. Frank Sinatra received my bread for many years. Lauren Bacall is a very faithful customer. And uh, Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, received my bread. 
So it's quite amusing thinking that those people receive their bread at home every week or eventually twice a month. So it's like a subscription. The bakery is at its busiest in the dead of night. While most of Paris sleeps, in the cellars beneath the store, the bakers are hard at work making bread to a secret and ancient recipe. The Poilain Bakery is one of the oldest in Paris. They've been baking bread here since the French Revolution. The secret of the bakery's worldwide success is its old-fashioned methods. Everything is done by hand, and the bread is still baked in oak-fired oven. At Poilain, everything is different from at other bakeries. As you can see, the weighing and shaping of the loaves is all done by hand. We use an old brick oven, like in the old days. Wood fired, of course. Everything is done manually except for the kneading of the dough, which we do in an old mechanical kneading bowl. But apart from that, it's all different from start to finish. My bread is very, very interesting because it's a, it is a traditional product. It's exactly the product that we had during the 18th and 19th century. It's maybe, maybe the most beautiful work in the world to make the bread of a human being, you know. The bakery turns out 1,000 loaves every night. A large size, which stays fresh for a week, costs $7. But some have been prepared to pay even more. In a back room is a secret collection of unique art. Years ago, struggling wartime artists used to give away their paintings in exchange for bread. The eccentric Spanish artist Salvador Dali was a regular customer here, and to show his appreciation created chandeliers from dough. This replica is a tribute to the baker's art. Whatever goes into Poilin's secret recipes, it certainly works. The shop is buzzing all day with customers buying a taste of old France. Two and a half million American tourists come to Paris each year. Many of them are secretly looking to fall in love. Paris has a reputation for romance, and the city inspired one of the world's most famous romantic images, the kiss at City Hall. It was taken by French photographer Robert Duaneau in 1954. It made him a fortune and has been a bestseller ever since, reproduced on at least half a million posters and cards, the symbol of young love in a big city. Not surprisingly, many other photographers have tried to copy his success, and there's no shortage of opportunities. In Paris, it seems everywhere you look, people are kissing. Lucas Schifre is the latest photographer to chase fame and fortune. He spends his spare time wandering the city, looking for courting couples and a perfect picture. While most choose predictable places, beside the River Seine or on top of the Eiffel Tower, they're not the best. Chiffre knows he's become an expert on Paris's most secret places to kiss. So, who knows, maybe this uh, lazy uh, Saturday morning, I'll get uh, the right picture will make me famous. Or maybe not. Schieffer's quest has led him to discover the spot used by his famous predecessor. Robert Duano stood in this cafe to take his picture, but it's now closed. And anyway, the picture would be impossible to recreate. Traffic and modern fountains have changed the view forever. So where now? Chiffre and his girlfriend Morella have taken a practical approach to research and decided that Paris's 10 parks are the new hotspots for romantic couples. It's, it's obvious that it's more romantic than other cities. I think parks are the most romantic places to, to kiss and to be kissed because they are quieter and uh, pretty with the flowers. So uh, it's, it hits you right there. But the best of the parks is also the most hidden. 
Right in the middle of downtown, behind the Louvre Art Gallery, are the gardens of the Royal Palace. Here, Shifra has discovered a haven of seduction. And maybe one day, he hopes, one of the pictures he takes here will make his fame and fortune too. In Paris, every kiss is special, but some are more special than others. There are 4,000 cafes in Paris. People sit day and night by the sidewalks, watching the world go by. The most glamorous is La Coupole. In its famous Art Deco restaurant, diners enjoy the best oysters in town. They're the house speciality. But not even the most regular customers here realize that under their feet is a hidden ballroom. Its events are never advertised, but every week, Around 300 people gather there for a secret ball, reviving an old tradition. In the 1920s, the dancers at La Coupole shocked polite society when they took to the floor. They danced the tango, a new and erotic style of dancing, which had arrived from the dance halls of Argentina. Today, there's a new Latin American craze. Tango is back, but dressing 1920s style remains part of the fun. Tonight is a special occasion. Masters of the tango, Eduardo Arquimbo and Veronica Villarreal are in town. They've come here to show Parisians the secret of putting Argentinian passion into their dancing. Together, they've danced all over the world. Villarreal was once Arquimbo's pupil until he discovered she made the perfect partner. I think that tango is a dance where the two dancers are the closest. They are forced to communicate with each other. That could be romantic or it could be something else, but you must be close. You can't tango without this, without total concentration. When the tango was first danced in Paris, it was the close physical contact between bodies that caused such shock. Dancing cheek by cheek, with legs entwined, had never been seen before. But now, it wins huge applause. The dance floor at La Coupole is proof that if you know where to look, Paris at night is exciting and exotic. The glittering lights of this city hide many secrets, known only to a relative few, until now.